I'm making this video to try to illustrate an easier way to show you guys why we standardize a data set. It's a very common stumbling block, including MGZ. All right, let's get going on this. So what we're going to do is we're going to take real data set. We're going to use some fake test scores. We're going to change them into Z scores. And then with those Z scores, we're going to look up the unique and corresponding probability values, also called P values, also called area under the curve. Some teachers call them percentiles. But let's keep moving on here. Okay. So we're going to take real data scores. Actually, it's pretend, but we're going to take a bunch of test scores. We're going to change them into Z scores. And the only reason we turn them into Z scores is to look up the probability values from each Z score from the Z scores, right? Okay, so that's what we do. We take the real scores, change them into Z scores, and from the Z scores, we find the P values. That's it in a nutshell. MGZ, out. Not really. Let's keep going. So the first thing we need is some data, but then after we get the data, we're going to go ahead and standardize all each and every test score, also called a measurement piece of data. So we're going to pretend that we have 75 test scores that range from 0 to 50, and I just, I just generated a table here. These are all individual test scores, and there's 75 of them. So first thing I'm going to do is going to make a histogram with the ranges of 10, or the intervals of 10, and it looks like this. So remember, how many people got between 0 and 10? It looks like, my eyeballs ain't that good, so it looks like maybe 10 or 11. How many got 11 to 20? There was about 16, et cetera, et cetera, right? So this is definitely a normal data set. That's a biggie. None of this stuff works unless it's a normal data set, and it is, right? So this data is this data. So now we're going to go ahead and make a number line from 0 to 50, and these would represent the test scores, right? 0 was the lowest, 50 was the highest, Next step, we got to find the mean and the standard deviation from the data set. And that's a different video. I'm not going to show you how to do that here, but use Excel. And I rounded to the nearest whole number. I do not want decimals to slow you guys down. So the mean of the data is 25 and the standard deviation is 12. So the mean is 25. Okay, that's how that works. And if I put my histogram on top of this number line... I had to stretch it out a little bit. You, you could kind of see how it would fit this. The height of the, of the rectangle is how many there are, and it fell within each of these ranges here. So I'm going to put it back in there, and then I'm going to just put in the, the bell curve. You see how it kind of it kind of outlines the histogram? So we're going to get rid of the histogram and just use the bell curve also called the normal frequency distribution curve or the normal curve. It's got many, many names, but let's keep pressing on. So I'm going to use the standard deviation and I'm going to, I'm going to mark off the standard deviations using the number 12 on the number line, right? So that's where they are down here. We got the little one, 13, 37, 49. And how I got those was I took the mean and I added one standard deviation, right? So 25 plus 12 is 37. And for this next one, 49 down here, I added two standard deviations. Straight 2 times 12 was 24. So 25 plus 24 is 49. And then going the other way, I subtracted one standard deviation. So 25 minus 12 is 13. And that little tiny one down there is 25 minus two standard deviations, which is 25 minus 24, which is one. So that's how we got these numbers. One, 13, 37, 49, right? They are, they are adding and subtracting the number 12, which is the value of a standard deviation. So these are real test scores, right? Between zero and 50. All these numbers represent real test scores. So now we're gonna make some changes let me move this up so we can get some working room here. Remember, the mean is 25, standard deviation is 12. So what we're going to do now is we're going to standardize all of the data. And here's the standard deviation formula, in case you forget, right? So a z-score is any, the, the first x is any individual data score, right? Any test score. 
And this is the mean, this is the standard deviation. So what we did was we took all the real scores, we ran them through the Z function there and turned them into Z scores. So these are basically the same, right? Real test scores or the standardized test scores to Z scores. They're the same thing. One data set's been standardized, that's all. Okay. Time to add the Z values to the number line. Okay, we're going to make a new number line that's going to just simply be Z values. Now, a Z value is the number of standard deviations away from the mean it is. Remember this thing? Okay, that's why we got the 1 and the 13 and the 37 and the 49. They are all adding or subtracting multiples of 12, which is the standard deviation. So it looks like this, right? 1 as a test score is negative 2 as a Z score. 13 as a test score is negative 1. As a Z score, the mean is 0. Standard, always, if a normal data set, the mean of a normal data set is always 0 after it's been standardized. 37 is 1. And 49 is 2. Again, these are the number of standard deviations away from the mean. So now we don't really need the number line anymore with the tests. We don't need those anymore because we're switching everything over to the Z scores. And I'm going to show you why here in a minute. So there they are. Let's move it up. Just to double check, right? So Z scores, real test scores, they, they fit the same curve here. So now we have our Z table. It doesn't go out past 2 because our data set's kind of small. It only goes from 0 to 50. And again, they're the same thing. Same distribution. One uses real values from test scores. The other one uses the Z table. That's, that's why we use it, right? Because the Z table, we can get the area under the curve based on these Z scores. That's why we do it. So by area under the z-scores, let me pull one up for you real quick here. And then uh, there's one, okay? So most tables, there's a, there's a positive z-score table, there's a negative z-score table. This is a positive z-score table. But all these, area, all these numbers underneath the columns here, these represent the area under the curve to the left of whatever that z-score is. Hopefully this little picture up here will help you, right? But that's what that is. So let's do one, okay, shall we? Yes, okay. So an example, what's the probability, the area under the curve, that a z-score will be less than 0.64? Okay, that's right about there on, an, on the z-scores. Now, do not confuse the z-scores with the area under the curve, all right? They're two separate ideas, two separate numbers. Got it? So if we got a 0.64 z-score, we want everything to the left of it. It's going to kind of look like this. Draw that line up to the curve. And again, it's, it's to the left of. It's less than 0.64. All these tables, all the software is set up for less than. Remember, the less than will equal the less than symbol in the actual problem. And it kind of looks like that. So we know it's over 50%. And why do we know that? Because it's, it's, it's past the mean, right? The mean cuts the data into 50%. 50% of the data is less than the mean. 50% of the data is greater than the mean. Got it? So we know it's going to be over 50%. But let's get exact on it. Let's go ahead and we're going to look it up in a Z table. So it's 0 .064. Let me open up this bad boy again. I don't know if you could see this or not. Uh, let me see if I can make it bigger for you guys. So this is how you find it, right? There's the z-score, so we go down to 0 0.6. This first number would be 0 0.60. The second one would be 0 0.61. This third one would be 0 0.62, right? You see, you add these numbers to the these numbers, and that gives you the second place value. So we're looking for 0 0.064, and there it is right there. So the area under the curve, the p-value connected to a 0.64 z-score is 0.7389, right? So the area, so that green shaded area is roughly 74%. We opened the table already. Those are my notes. Okay, so this represents the area here. What's the total area under the curve? It's 100%. What's the area less than a z-score of 0 0.64? 73.89%. Okay, whatever floats your boat. You can either use the decimal system or percentages. 
So now I'm going to throw this in because it seems to be a part of confusion for a lot of people. So now I'm asking you, what's the probability that the z-score will be greater than that 0.064? See that? What's, what's the probability, what's the area under the curve that a z-score will be greater than that? That's that little chunk of area there. What you got to remember is that the area under the curve is 100%. So what all you got to do is figure out what the less than value is and subtract it from 1. I'm going to say that again. Right? The area under this whole curve is 100%. So if we know this side, all we got to do is subtract this side from 1, or 100%, and that gives us the other side, the greater than value. Okay, So this little chunk here is 0.2611. So the probability that you're going to get a z-score at random is 26.11%. Isn't that wonderful? So always double check yourself, right? So if you got a less than and a greater than problem, just go ahead and add them together. They should always equal one, right? The area under the curve is either one or for you percentage freaks, the area under the curve is 100%. But 100% is the same as one, okay? So we're getting to a place that a lot of people make the same mistake. And it's what I call a big rule. So pay attention to the big rule here. What it is, is remember, first of all, that the area under the curve, the total area under the curve is either a 1 or 100%, either way you want to go. I'm running into problem where people don't realize that 100% is the same as 1, but they are the same value. So the area under the curve total is 1. So this is the big rule right here. So the probability that a z-score is less than any number plus the probability that the z-score is greater than that same number, when you add those two probabilities up, the answer is always 1. Okay, so let's take an example. Let's say our x value is here. So let's say it's negative 0.5 or something. What that does is it splits this, this the area under the curve into two parts. Right? So it's going to be the part on the left and the part on the right. So the part on the left is the is the z is the probability of the z value being less than x. The probability on the right is the probability that the z is greater than the x. But when you add them together, they got to equal one. Doing a little bit of algebra, if we sub subtract the less than side from one, you get the greater side, greater than side, and same thing. You know, you can work it backwards. But I'm rambling. All right, let's put all this stuff together so it makes sense. So back to our original test scores. Remember all those test scores? Blah, 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 blah. I got a bunch of them. Got 75 of them. The mean was 25. The standard deviation was 12. So here's a problem. What's the probability that a test chosen at random will be less than 32? So less than 32. So th look at the number 32. We're going to find a z-score for 32. But now I already know part of the problem because it's greater than the mean. I know it's going to be greater than 50%. I do know that. But first step, we're going to change 32. We're into a z-score. We're going to standardize 32 using the formula. So substituting the known values. The first x up here will be our 32. The red x will be our mean of 25. And this little sigma on the bottom will be 12. We plug in the numbers. We get a z-score of 0.58. So what that literally means is that 32 is 0.58 standard deviations greater than the mean. It's greater than because it's positive. So now we're going to go ahead and open a Z table and figure out what the area under the curve is from the Z table. Come on, Mr. Z table, please hold. So at our Z table, we look for 0 0.05 on the left-hand column. 0 0.05, there it is. Bam. Now we look for the row heading of a 0.8. So this is the, this one right here. So where this column intersects with that row, 0.05 going across is 0.7190. Hope you can see that. So the z-score of 0.58 gives you the area under the curve of 0.7190. And we did open the table, right? Got it. Say it again, z-score 0.58 gives you a p-value of 0 0.7190, or 71.90%. What that literally means is, if you pick the test at random, 
because it's a normal data set, then you have a, like a 72% chance of grabbing a test score that'll be less than 32. Now, what's the probability that that test that you chose at random will be greater than 0 0.32 than 32? Would be simply the original for less than 32, which was 71.90%. We're going to simply subtract that from 1 or 100%. That comes out to be 28.10%. So, again, the probability that you're going to pick a test score that's greater than 32 at random is about 28%. And that's how this stuff works. In a nutshell, you take re real scores, you standardize them, change them into z-scores. Because we have the z-tables, the data has to fit a normal distribution curve. So we change the real test scores into z-scores. And from the z-scores, we find the p-values. And I really hope that worked. But that's it. MGZ out. Math Guy Zero.